I am intimately familiar with the horrors and the suffering of this world, and I have personally experienced every bad thing to ever occur across all of time and all of space, and the weight of these terrible things weighs on me, dragging me down day by day. But this comic is pretty good. Howdy, I'm Kurt Williams, and today we're looking at issue one of The Last Mermaid by Derek Kirk Kim. It's in this almost perfectly square format, which is kind of neat because it's novel, but it's also kind of annoying because I don't know where the heck I'm going to put it. I've never read anything else by Kim, but as I read in his letter in the back of the issue, this is the first comic he's published in a decade. And he's been thinking about this concept for that entire time, and you can really tell by the issue that he's put a lot of thought and energy into this story. Not a lot actually happens in this first issue. We have a whole lot of showing and like no telling so we just have to get the vibes for the whole situation and the characters which isn't a bad thing it's a very simple idea with tangible emotions and I'm a big fan of simple stories I'm a simple guy and I like simple things so in this issue we're following around this mermaid obviously who lives in this giant mech suit which has a bunch of water in it she's in dire need of a water change so she and her axolotl buddy named Lottie are looking around for some fresh water and whether or not the fresh water is actual fresh water as opposed to salt water Water is not specified. I would assume that a mermaid is a saltwater creature, but axolotls are freshwater creatures, so I don't know how they could cohabitate, but maybe I'm overthinking it. So in this issue, she wanders across this desert that used to be San Francisco, looking for water. She falls down a hole, and her giant bubble gets cracked, and she's flopping around without any water. And the very last thing that we see is a plant, which implies that there's water nearby, so maybe there's hope. And that is it. Now we do spend a lot of time seeing how she can move around in her mech suit. She can either drive it like a car or she can walk it around like a transformer. We got lots of landscape shots with really good coloring work in there. There's this one ominous scene where we see that there's somebody up on the Golden Gate Bridge watching her, but that's the only scene that they show up in and we have no idea if they're following or if they just noticed her and didn't really care. I suppose we're supposed to believe that he's following her. Most of the comic is spent showing us intense breakdowns of moments, like she's sleeping in one panel and then her eyes are open in the next panel, but there's no other change. Or it takes like five panels for it to show us how she transitions the mech suit from a car into a walking thing. Or there'll be like three panels where the axolotl swims over to her and then nibbles on her nose and then she wakes up. Which again is not a problem. I like that we have these really drawn out moments so that we can feel like we're waking up with her. Or we can feel like the mech suit is changing while we're in it and we have to wait through every single step. The comic reads kind of like a storyboard for an animated TV show, which makes sense because Derek Kirk Kim spent the last decade working in TV. So it feels like you're watching a show. It doesn't feel like you're jumping from one moment to the next like a lot of comics do. You're feeling every single moment, every single transition that the characters feel. So the character work, having a mermaid that's in this giant bubble mech suit thing is a really cool idea. It's a great concept. We haven't really had a chance to dig into her character and we haven't really had a chance to dig into the world. I don't really know what the scope of the story is other than survival. So overall the story is just okay so far. We're really really taking a lot of time setting the stage for further issues. The art is just gorgeous. The cover here is a great representation of the interior art. The lighting is all really well done. This panel in particular stood out to me because we have these really harsh lights coming from the top left, but we also have the headlight, which is really well done, and the little glowing lights up by the handle there. All of this is just really pretty. The section of art that stood out to me the most was when the water is draining out of her bubble, and we have all these great light effects of this dramatic lighting on the ripples of the water, and the way he colors what's outside the water already and what's still inside the water and there's even a little bit of distortion for what's inside the water because you're looking at the water from outside of the water. It's just a kind of quality that you don't often see in comics. Like this is a labor of love. I read the Wikipedia article on this guy and it said that he stopped drawing comics because he was sick of the monotony of it but you really wouldn't be able to tell by this issue because he doesn't take any shortcuts. One of the things that kind of bothered me that probably doesn't bother anybody else is that the water toxicity level in her bubble rose way way too fast, like it's on an exponential curve. And for the ammonia levels or the nitrate levels or whatever it is that they call toxicity in there to be rising that fast, she'd have to be like non-stop peeing, which maybe she is, I don't know how mermaids work, but I think I can suspend my disbelief long enough to enjoy the comic. And enjoy it I did. I'm gonna give issue one of The Last Mermaid a solid 8 out of 10. I think this comic was just 
barely a little bit too slow, but I do really appreciate how much time was put into each moment in the story, how we really got to feel like we were the main character. So if you haven't picked it up already, I wholeheartedly recommend it. This is a great all-ages book with real stakes, but it doesn't have, like, excessive profanity in it. Did you read it? What do you think?